You were never created to be stationary. God gave you the ability to move and communicate for a reason. When Jesus established the church, he intended it to be a movement. And upon his return to heaven, his final words, his command, his mission could be summed up in one word. Go. It was a very sad time in our country, and maybe some of you, you weren't born yet, or you were too young to remember, but at 1138 on January 28th, 1986, the space shuttle Challenger exploded, killing all seven of its crew members. And in the aftermath of the investigation, what was found was this little rubber seal called an O-ring that had failed. Because on that morning of January 28th, it was very cold in Florida, which usually doesn't happen. And as the space shuttle took off, the O-ring, because of the temperature, it failed, and it caused a breach, allowing pressurized gas to escape into a chamber it should not have been in, and it caused the explosion. And the bewildering part of this disaster is that NASA knew that this might happen in cold temperatures, but they gave the ghost signal anyway. So here's this little tiny part that causes this horrible disaster, and it sent the space agency into a tailspin for years to come. The space program had these awesome plans and awesome goals to accomplish. They wanted to launch rockets into outer space and go to distant planets and to other solar systems. But because of something as little as an O-ring... Those plans were laid to waste. See, tonight, our church, Victory Christian Center, and the network of churches that we are a part of, we have awesome plans and goals. But instead of launching rockets into outer space, we want to launch churches out into the harvest field, into other cities in Florida to other states in our nation, and to other countries around the world. That is our mission. That is our goal. That is our prize. But just like an O-ring stopped the mission of the Challenger and caused a horrific tragedy, there are things that can stop us from launching churches. And I want to preach a message tonight that I entitled, Preparing to Launch. Actually, we were going to call, the, the conference theme was going to be called Preparing to Launch, but it's actually the title of my sermon. And I want to detail some things that can stop us from doing what God has called us to do. Because we are called, amen, as a church to launch churches. It is a very biblical calling. In the book of Acts, it, it details the very first church planting venture. And I want you to, uh, to turn with me to Acts chapter 13, verse 1 through 3. It will be on the screen. I want to read that to you this night. It says, now there were in Antioch in the church that were there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Siren, and Menah, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. I want you to pray with me. God, we thank you, Father, that you have brought us together tonight 
to hear your word. And I pray, God, that, that we would hear it, Father. God, with all the intensity, God, and understand, Father, you've called us to plant churches. You've called us to, to touch the world and to go. And, Father, I pray that you would help us to understand what you're trying to speak to us, God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So here it is, this church in Antioch. They are fasting. They are praying. And the Holy Spirit says, I want you to set apart for me Barnabas and another man named Saul. Well, Saul ended up becoming referred to as Paul. And Barnabas and Saul, they're set apart. They lay hands on these men and they send them out. This is the first real church plant. And Paul and Barnabas, uh, they go out and they are very successful in planting many, many churches for the kingdom of God. See, I remember as a very young Christian reading the book of Acts. And, you know, I wasn't saved that long at the time. And I'm reading the book of Acts, and it had this profound impact on my life. Because as I'm reading this, this book in the Bible, I could see very clearly that the first century church was launching churches. No one told me this. I didn't read it in a book. You know, I didn't look at it in a magazine article. No one, I didn't hear a sermon about this. This was something that I saw for myself right in the book of Acts. Churches were planting other churches and launching churches out into the harvest field. And I remember this just impacted me like, wow, this is what it's about. And I remember going to my pastor at the time, and I asked him, why are we not doing this? I'm reading it in the Bible, but we're not doing this. And he looked at me like dumbfounded, like, what are you talking about? He had no idea what I was talking about. But I had saw, seen it so clearly so later on, after that pastor had moved to another church, I ended up hooking up with an, uh, an, another organization that understood this dynamic. They understood that God calls churches to birth other churches. Just as I had seen it, to, you know, these many years ago, over 30 years ago, that thing is still in me. It's still here. It's still burning in my heart that churches need to plant churches. They need to be involved in this launching churches into other cities and other states and other nations of the world. And that's why I admire a pastor named Tommy Alvarez of New Destiny and and uh, Pastor Henry and his church from uh, Wichita, they're a part of, of Pastor Tommy's uh, movement. He understands this. He knows what it's about. Uh, also, Pastor Tony from India, he understands this dynamic that churches need to plant churches. And as the leader of this church and this network, uh, that is my heartbeat. You know, this past Sunday, <coughs> I uh, preached a sermon, and I used a quote. You know, some of you weren't here, but um, uh, I, I want to share that quote that I talked about. And this is the quote. It's, direction, not intention, determines our destination. See, our destination as a church and as a network of churches is to plant other churches, into other cities and states and nations. That is our destination. Now that's a good intention, but our intentions are no good unless we have set our direction on that task at hand. And that's one of the first things that can stop us from doing what God has called us to do, just like the O-ring stopped the, the space program. Uh, amen. This is a thing that can stop us from launching churches, is our direction can be away from that and not on that. Our direction has to be focused on the destination of church planting. If it's not, 
it, we will be diverted into something else that we, you know, that might be good, that might be nice, that might be even important, but it will get us away from the most important thing that God has called us to do. Are you with me tonight? You know, back in 1865, a man named William Booth founded the Salvation Army. And that movement of God, the main destination was the goal of the Salvation Army was to get people saved, to see people come to salvation. And it was a powerful move of God. Thousands and thousands of people gave their life to Jesus Christ because of the Salvation Army. Thank God for that. But something happened after William Booth passed away. The direction towards seeing souls saved changed into other things. It changed into feeding the poor and to housing the homeless and to ringing bill, uh, bells at Christmas time. You know, all good things of themselves, but the direction of seeing souls saved was diverted. They weren't doing what he had originally called them to do. And see, tonight we cannot allow that to happen here at Victory Christian Center. We have to keep on our direction of planting churches for the kingdom of God. Now that's one of the things that can stop us. And there's some other things that I want to look at too. I want to look at another one. You know, after the Challenger, uh, the Challenger space shuttle exploded, what happened was uh, the money that was funded into NASA ended up drying up. Okay, before they had this massive budget, but after that disaster, the budget kind of disappeared. And see, it took billions and billions of dollars to fund the space program, but then all of a sudden, there's no money to do that anymore, and they weren't launching any more rockets. And see... The same thing happens in church planting. Amen. It takes finances to plant churches. Not billions and billions, thank God, but thousands and thousands of dollars. It's an expensive thing to plant a church. And you can't do it on food stamps and gift cards. Amen. You can't. It doesn't work that way. And one of the greatest concerns as a leader is that we will have couples uh, that, uh, that are ready to go, they're willing to go, but we don't have the money to send them. They're ready. Pastor, send me. And you look at them and they are ready, but you don't have the money to send them. See, our church is doing really well financially. We are. But you throw a, a few church plants in there, and <laughs> it upsets the apple cart. It changes everything. You know, it's kind of like a young couple. You could have a young couple, and, you know, they're both working jobs, and they're doing pretty good, man. You know, they're paying the bills, and they're even saving some money. But then all of a sudden, you have these little people that come on the scene, they're called kids. Like, where did they come from? Where did they, what, what's it, what is this? And all of a sudden, you realize very quickly that they cost a lot of money. I mean, have you ever noticed how much stuff a little kid, like the kid's like this big, and he needs a bassinet, and he needs a playpen, and he needs a car seat, and he needs this. And then you, you have to feed them, too. You have to actually give them food. It's like, what is up with that? And here's this young couple that was doing really good financially before, but then you've got these little people around, and then they're not doing as good as they were. They're barely making it. You know, church planting is like that. Amen. They are our babies, and we have to take care of them. We have to provide for them. 
You know, and we're not going to be able to do it to, in our current financial position. It's not going to happen. You know, a real interesting set of verses is found in the book of Luke, chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. And it says this, Soon afterwards, he began going around from city, uh, one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the, the wife of Chusa, uh, Herod uh, Stewart, and Susanna. And many others who were contributing to the support out of their private means. So here's Jesus and the disciples. You know, they're going around to different cities and different villages and all these places. Uh, but there are people that are financially supporting them to be able to do that. Now, if Jesus and the disciples needed financial support to, back in Bible days, how much more will we need support to plant churches? It takes money. You know, when you get a building for a baby church, uh, you know, uh, uh, landlords just say, oh, you're planting a church, have it for free. You know, it's, go ahead, take it. I mean, it costs money. And if we're going to do this great work, if we're going to touch the world, if we're going to touch cities throughout our country and our state, amen, we have to be ready for this. Because that will be one of the things that stops us, just like it stopped NASA from launching more rockets. This will stop us from launching more churches. We have to straighten this out. Amen. If we're moving forward, it's got to be corrected, folks. Here's the third thing. <coughs> is we miss the individual. We miss the individual. And I was reading a book, uh, a story about a lady named Karen. And this lady was an assistant manager at Wawa Gas Station, okay? You know, Wawa has landed in our area. Hey, man, if you guys haven't found out about it, you got to go into one of the stores. I think my wife is addicted to their chocolate shakes. <laughs> hey, man. You know, we'll just be sitting around at home. She goes, you want a, you want a Wawa shake? <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's almost an hour round trip. No, I don't want one. <laughs> Well, here's this lady. She works for Wawa. And one night, this man walks in to her store, and he's carrying a dozen roses. And he walks up to Karen, and he said, these are for you. And this lady, Karen, says, she's flabbergasted. Like, well, you must be mistaken. You know, I, I don't even know who you are, and I don't know what they're for. And he goes, I know you might not remember me, but I came in last night, and I want to tell you what happened. He said, I came in. To your, uh, actually, last night, I was going to go to a secluded place, and I had a, a hose, and I was going to put the hose in the back of my uh, car's exhaust pipe and put the hose into my car. And I was going to do that, and I was going to end my life. But I decided, you know what, I'm going to have a last meal. So I thought, what am I going to eat? And he said, I'm going to have a wah wah hoagie, you know, or a sub sandwich. So this guy's going to take his life, but he's going to have a hoagie before he kicks it, you know? Amen. <laughs> hey, Wawa's good, man. I'm telling you, man. It's, <laughs> even if it's, you know, like you won't want to. So here's this guy. He walks into Wawa. This is his last meal. And he goes in there, and here's this lady, Karen. The store's packed out. There's all these people. But here's this lady. She treats him so nice. And is friendly to him. She makes his sandwich. She ends up stopping what she's doing and actually talks to this guy and has a conversation and just shows him with just so much respect. And this guy took his sandwich and ate his sandwich. He put the, the hose in his exhaust pipe and the other part inside the uh, cab of his car. And he started the engine. And he's sitting there. He's going to kill himself. And all of a sudden, he thinks about this nice lady that he just met at Wawa that was so respectful to him and took out of her time to actually talk to him. And he turned his car engine off and didn't do what he had planned to do. 
And the moral of the story is Karen didn't miss the individual. <laughs> if she would have, that guy would have ended his life. See, church planting is made up of individuals. Our entire ministry is based on reaching one person at a time. To set this example for us, many years ago, when he's on the cross uh, about ready to end his life uh, for our salvation, and there's another guy there, and he's ministering to him on the cross. Because it's made up of one individual at a time. And we cannot miss the individual. You've heard some of these sermons uh, from, uh, you know, all the preachers that we've had, uh, you know, and we cannot forget about people. It's all about people, the individual. Now, I want to give you one more thing, because I don't want to preach over my time either. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I was real stickler with the guys. Hey, stick to your time, so I'm going to stick to my time, too. I want to give you one more thing that can stop the launching of churches. And when I say this at first, it's going to not make sense to you, but I want to let you know I will explain it, okay? So don't think I'm crazy. But this is the fourth one, and it's this. Having our barrels full of the wrong things. Having our barrels full of the wrong things. You know, I have some next-door neighbors that are really nice people. They're really nice, man. And we've lived next to each other for uh, almost 12 years. And I remember when they first moved in, that their kids were really little. And just uh, Lindy would even babysit them sometimes. And, and just really nice people. And the very first church service we ever had for Victory Christian Center, they came to it. They came to it. And throughout the years periodically they would come to our church, you know, once in a while, once in a blue moon, moon they would come. Well, a little while back, um, I went outside of my house one day, and I saw the wife, and she was, you know, coming out of her house, and she motioned, like, hey, can, can you come over here? And, and so I went over there, and we started talking, and she was telling me, you know what, uh, Larry, you know, my kids are teenagers now, and I am so worried about them. There's so much stuff going on in the world and drugs and, you know, premarital sex and all this crazy stuff. And you know what? I, I need to bring them to church and get them involved. And, you know, this lady had a Christian upbringing. And she said, you know, I want them to know what I know even though she doesn't come to church, you know. And then she's telling me this and she's crying. She starts crying. And she's telling me this. And I told her, you know what, just bring them, man. Just come and serve God with us. And, you know, we've got youth group and we've got services. And just come, man. Get your kids involved in the things of God. And she said she agreed that she would, but then she had kind of a, a, kind of a qualifier. She said, but I have a little bit of a problem. <laughs> My kids are really in the softball, you know. Uh, especially my daughter, you know, she's, uh, all, you know, really good, and she's on the traveling team, and they have games every weekend, and, and all year round, and during the week, they've got practices, and, and you know, she does a lot of softball stuff, and I said, well, you know what, you, you got to put God first, man, softball ain't going to get you to heaven, so you got to put God first, and she said, okay, and then, you know, we stopped talking, and I went back to my house, and she never followed through. She never even came one time with the kids. And what happened was, this is about a month ago, I <clears throat> had a, a letter for my neighbors that uh, I had to drop off in, in, in their door. And um, so I went over to their house, and no one was home. And I went to the front door to put the letter in the crack of the door. And as I was there, I, I see this big barrel. And I go, and it's right there by the front door. I'm like, what's that barrel? And I walk over to it. I'm nosy neighbor, hey amen. <laughs> what's that barrel, man? What's up with that? And I walk over to this barrel, and this barrel is full of softballs. I'm talking full to the brim 
of softballs, dozens and dozens of softballs. And I'm looking at this, and I just thought it was unusual. I'm thinking, that's a lot of softballs, man. And I'm looking at this, and God speaks to me. And he says, the reason they're not serving me is because their barrel is full of softballs. Softball is their life. It's the most important activity that they are involved in. And the question I have for everyone here tonight is, what is your barrel full of? You know, there's nothing wrong with softball. I used to play. It's a fun game. But the question is, what is your barrel full of? What are you giving your life to tonight? What are you giving your time to? See, if our church is going to launch churches, a good percentage of the people in the church need to have their barrels full of the right things. You know, I'll be the first one to admit here. I'm serious. I'm not the brightest pastor in the world. I'm really not, man. Seriously. You know, some of you guys know you know, my bad English, you know, and I've, I've talked about this before that, man, I'm terrible at spelling, man. I mean, really bad. You know, I, I shared some stories of spelling bees, you know, Larry spelled cat. Ah! You know, when I was a kid, man, I think I get the hives, you know, and I'm not the brightest pastor. And I understand I might not be the best preacher, and I might not make all the greatest decisions. But one thing I can say is my barrel is full of seeing souls saved. It's full, man. <laughs> Wednesday night, we had a service. You know, it was a special one for Anthony and we saw 13 people come to Christ, man. Whoa. My barrel is full. And it's not just full of that, but it's full of serving people and discipling people and, of course, launching churches. That's what my barrel is full of. But what is your barrel full of tonight? What is it full of? I want to end this sermon with a true story. There was a Christian man who grew up in a Christian home back in the late 1800s. And as a young man, he felt the call of God. And God spoke to him to be an evangelist. I mean, it was a powerful call. And he started pursuing that calling. And at the age of 24, he enrolled into a school of evangelism in Brussels. And he was on this thing, man. He was into it. And he studied hard, and he ended up graduating. And then after graduation, he went and preached for a year, preaching the gospel. But the problem was, he also had another talent besides preaching, which we all can have more than one talent. He was also an awesome painter. Not just like painting houses, but like painting portraits and things. And he was very talented at that. And what ended up happening, his barrel became fuller and fuller of painting instead of preaching and he finally ended up forsaking his call of preaching and his barrel became totally full of painting it became so full that he started painting like a madman just painting non-stop and he painted over 200 Paintings in a two-year period. That's a lot of painting, man, in two years. But at the age of 37 years old, he was very confused, 
very impoverished, and he borrowed a gun, and he ended his life. Now, most of us in here know of this man and his name. His name was Vincent Van Gogh, probably the most famous painter of our time frame that's ever lived. But even though he was famous, he missed what God had for him because his barrel was full of something else. And so I end this sermon tonight is what is your barrel full of? See, because if we're going to launch churches, we cannot have our barrels full of something else. Because just like a little O-ring brought down the whole space program, there are things that can stop us from doing what God has called us to do as a church. When our direction gets diverted, when the finances aren't there to do the mission, when we miss the individual, and when our barrels are full of something else. What is your barrel full of tonight? Amen. That's all I have. I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Daniel. Amen.